Great. Welcome to our viewers. Again, thanks for joining us today for our webinar, The Rise of Ransomware and How It Has Impacted Enterprise Data Security. Presenting today are Richard Steenum, Chief Research Analyst at IT Harvest, and Sanjay Jagat, Senior Director of Product Management and Alliances at Cloudian. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much, Laura. Appreciate that. So, you know, as I was thinking about the history of ransomware, I realized that Cybercrime has taken, uh, has evolved constantly, and I've often pointed to the fact that the security industry is different from other areas of technology, and that it has an outside driver. And those, that outside driver, of course, is threat actors. And we break those threat actors down into several groups. They could be insiders, have to deal with uh, insider threats. Um, it can be cyber criminals, and it can be nation state espionage and nation state, you know, cyber warfare in the ultimate. And cybercrime is the great driver of the security industry because the cyber criminals are as imaginative and entrepreneurial as anybody uh, creating a startup with the additional uh, absence of the restraint of doing things legally, morally, and ethically. So they do whatever they can to uh, gain money, basically. And back in the early 2000s, cybercrime was people installing spyware so they could uh, change your default browser and uh, do more clicks on their websites. And, you know, pretty small uh, dollar value types of activities. But thanks to mostly the actions of what was then called the Russian Business Network, which actually disbanded a few years later after they had started the first cybercrime as a service, and they basically started selling toolkits for infecting people's uh, computers back then, and of course it evolved quickly to cell phones, uh, to steal credentials. And it was always a matter of if they needed to steal you know, credit card credentials or login credentials in order to get access to money and then somehow figure out how to get the money into their own hands. And they always left a money trail. And so therefore, when their operations got big enough, they got the attention of the FBI and other law enforcement agencies around the world. Um, and they had to be very careful that they didn't end up getting arrested and thrown in jail. Well, in 2009, Satoshi Nakamoto released the very first version of Bitcoin. And uh, in January 9th of 2009, um, and Bitcoin offered, you know, the first instance of a workable, uh, you know, financially and cryptographically secure means of payment. Uh, it also is relatively easy to anonymize. Therefore, instead of asking victims of uh, uh, extortion attacks when cyber criminal gangs in Eastern Europe were threatening online gaming sites with DDoS attacks, and back then they'd say, you know, pay us $30,000 in increments of just below $10,000 uh, to avoid the money laundering regulations and, and use Western Union to send us the money to avoid being DDoS, you know, on the day before the big uh, boxing match where all the gaming and gambling was occurring. And they would, they would pay that. The victims would uh, uh, see the pain and that they're losing much more than $30,000 a day. Uh, so it was, it was easy for them to come up with a decision to, to make that kind of payment. Well, the first instances of ransomware were targeted against individual computers. And it was a simple fact of getting somebody to download a uh, remote access, access Trojan or RAT and then install a uh, simple system that would encrypt your hard drive. The, and, of course, asking for money to decrypt it is what changed and what made ransomware the threat it is today. And it's easily the, the largest uh, criminal threat that we face across the world. Um, and some of these, these first instances were the, the concept of a cryptographic uh, uh, extortion like this was first proposed in 
uh, 2000 or uh, in 19 uh, in the early 80s, uh, 89, and then the first instance of of ransomware is created by this Jeffrey Pops in 89. He called it PC Cyborg. It was completely misconfigured and didn't actually work. Um, but fast forward to four years after uh, Bitcoin was available to, to do this, and we had the 2013 crypto locker. So was, most of us first became aware of ransomware in 2013. It's estimated that CryptoLocker earned $27 million in ransom payments uh, from basically individuals who were being asked to pay about $900 a piece. So do the math and you'll see there's a lot of people that succumb to ransomware. We've had other instances of, of you know, uh, crypto malware. Uh, usually uh, we lump them into groups or teams, because it appears that the, you know each family of crypto malware is uh, created by uh, teams, you know, cyber criminal teams, gangs that, that work together to create them and then promulgate them uh, and kind of share the wealth in what they can grab. Uh, I don't know how you pronounce Soda no Nokibi um, was released last year and is still one of the most active uh, ransomware. Uh, families out there. Um, Maze was also extremely disruptive uh, at the time. And supposedly, they, the Maze uh, ransomware team has retired as of late, uh, earlier in 2020. So you start adding up the numbers, and you get to uh, millions and millions of dollars that have been paid on these one-offs. But ransomware started to evolve a couple of years ago as attackers started to realize that there were bigger targets than just individuals. And of course, that was the enterprise. Um, that's kind of where I get involved and where probably most of the people attending get involved as well. I think it was 2015, I was attending a conference in London. And there was a round table with about 20 CISOs. We went around the room, I asked them what their top concern was, and it was all ransomware. Every single one of them, their top concern was ransomware. And it wasn't because that ransomware was um, uh, you know, something that they were uh, seeing as an enterprise threat. It was still a threat against individuals, employees of the company. But if the CEO or CFO or any C-level person lost access to everything on their laptop, the entire IT department would have to drop everything in order to try and recover that, uh, negotiate with the uh, ransomware teams to you know, try and get the, the uh, system decrypted, um, ideally just recover <laughs> in most cases. Um, so they were almost dealing with ransomware on a consumer level. Uh, so the pain was much greater than the requested ransom. So they were tending to actually pay the ransom. Um, when I give advice to people to avoid ransomware, it's, it's almost a flashback to advice I've been giving for 20 years now, um, right? Your system should be patched as quickly as possible. I know that's difficult for a lot of organizations even today. Uh, your antivirus should be up to date as quickly as possible. Uh, somehow you have to either encourage people not to click on links that they receive in emails, um, or install some sort of protection so that they either can't click on those links or you check them for maliciousness before something's downloaded and executed. Uh, I include the don't download from pirate sites because quite often I'll advise people, the first question I'll ask somebody if they're worried about ransomware is do they use a Apple product or a PC? Because if you use an Apple product, you've eliminated 99.9% .9 of ransomware attacks. The documented ones I found uh, involve having to download and install software kind of manually that you would find from a pirated uh, software site. So you know, definitely, if you're going to download anything, use the Apple Store or the Google Store, um, where at least they do some checks when those applications are initially allowed on the store. So they don't 
do a very good job of checking updates to those applications if they're compromised. And then I know it sounds straightforward and simple, but having a backup of all of your data that you do consistently, and it's funny, uh, Sanjay will, will laugh because when we started talking about doing this webinar several weeks ago, I you know, realized that I wasn't following my own advice and hadn't backed up my system in, I don't know, 270 days because Mac users get a little complacent. So I'll let you know, Sanjay, I am backing up regularly now because if you Perfect. ever hear somebody tell you <laughs> if you ever hear somebody tell you to back up, you have to back up that day because you'll have some sort of disk failure um, almost immediately. It's just the way the world works. I don't know why. Uh, on the enterprise side is, is when we started to see the shift to uh, it's kind of a combination of uh, targeted attacks or so-called APTs uh, to the ransomware world. So APTs, of course, are uh, you know sophisticated attacks, and they follow a, a kind of a, a MITRE uh, attack methodology where they do recon on your organization. They get a foothold by getting somebody to open an email through a, a spear phishing attack, uh, and then they try and spread as surreptitiously as they can throughout the network to find a target that can allow them to exfiltrate critical data. Modify that slightly to now the point is install your, uh, your, your crypto malware in as, on as many devices as you can. Try and find network attached storage devices that you can also encrypt. So when you give the command uh, from your remote command and control server to encrypt everything, the uh, all of the devices on the network are quickly encrypted. The splash screens come up demanding the ransomware, or an email is sent to the appropriate person saying, you know, we've encrypted all your data, um, pay us X amount. Now, of, of course, uh, today the community is kind of um, scrambling to figure out what happened at one of the biggest uh, ransomware ransom demands ever made. Uh, for Foxconn, who just this past uh, November, um, their operations in Juarez, uh, Mexico, just south of the border, the U.S. border, um, somebody clicked on an email, uh, got infected, it spread throughout the plants and operations in Juarez, um, and they were basically taken down by having all their data encrypted. What's unusual about or noteworthy about this attack is, first of all, Foxconn is one of the biggest companies in the world. They are the biggest manufacturer of electronic gear, um, over $170 billion in revenue a year, operations all over the world. And luckily, this didn't spread beyond their Mexican facilities. And the ransom demand is for $34 million to get their data back. So uh, Pretty sure that's the biggest ransom demand, certainly, that, that we know of uh, that's been made public. Um, I could talk for a long time about uh, ransom negotiations, because I've worked with several people who are involved in that. And a $34 million ransom demand, I would bet, could easily be talked down to a million dollars. Um, the, uh, you know, an attacker should be perfectly happy with a million dollars rather than $34 million. Um, and if they can get that in Bitcoins, not very many Bitcoins today, uh, everybody would be happy. I want to mention the evolution. So Petya was a classic piece of uh, ransomware that was used in these types of uh, mass attacks against organizations in 2016. Um, and it confused us, everybody, a little bit when they saw a brand new piece of malware that was spreading around the world really quickly and had all the hallmarks and signatures of Petya. But some of the AV companies quickly determined that this was not Petya and labeled it such. And you shouldn't confuse the two because not Petya wasn't actually a ransomware attack, even though it's still encrypted hard drives, um, to make the computers completely useless and disabled them. It was a nation state attack 
according to uh, the author of the book Sandbine, uh, the attackers were part of the Russian military intelligence group, GRU, and they were attacking Ukraine. And it was a very sophisticated attack. They attacked a supply, a vendor of uh, accounting software that um, was kind of like your QuickBooks uh, for small businesses uh, used in Ukraine and uh, you know, broadly used in Ukraine. And the attackers got into the update servers of that company so that they could issue an update that was digitally signed, came from the right place, and updated everybody's software at once with NotPetya, which started to spread as a worm immediately from there. So all you needed, and in the case of uh, uh, Maersk, so one of the biggest shippers in the world, they had a single uh, instance of this uh, accounting software in, the, in a facility in uh, uh, Kiev, or uh, southern Ukraine, and it spread from that one instance to all of Maersk globally and shut them down completely. They, they lost access to all of their ability to control incoming and outgoing shipments from their uh, docks around the world. And the chairman of, of Maersk has said they suffered uh, well over $200 million in lost revenue. And the, the amount they had to pay people for not being able to take delivery and ship their containers around the world. Devastating, devastating attack uh, using everything that we have that we know about uh, the malware that, that does ransomware. Now, hit the wrong button. We also had the instance of what happened this past March when, uh, you know, the entire world uh, went on to went into shutdown. Um, everybody had to, you know, go home and work from home, and so we had a couple things going at once. We had people working on non-secure networks from their home computers, in some cases, um, or their office laptops that they had brought home. So not as well secured as uh, they traditionally would have been working from the office, and the attackers uh, started sending. Uh, phishing uh, scams out that would deal with uh, government payments, uh, uh, e you know, uh, easing checks and unemployment checks. Um, so lots of information or opportunity for disinformation to be used as a hook in a phishing attack. So we saw a 600% rise in those attacks uh, in that early part of COVID. And I'd like to point out that, you know, the the first reaction or the first uh, results from that 600% rise of phishing attacks is going to be some ransomware, successful ransomware attacks against individuals and against some companies. Uh, but if the average dwell time for an attacker on a network before the attack is discovered is about 210 days, according to the Poneman Institute, uh, we are now entering the phase when we're going to start learning about those successful those attacks that were successful starting last March. Uh, so it's going to be a interesting uh, end of the year and into 2021 as we hear more and more types of attacks, like the Foxconn attack, um, that are going to be uh, very large in nature. So that's kind of the COVID world we live in today. We're all working from home. One of the other repercussions is that many enterprises happen had to allow remote access to desktops in the corporate environment. And even though people would VPN in, they would connect using RDP, remote desktop protocol. And RDP is actually one of the primary, uh, or the primary way that ransomware is getting in to organizations today. We've also seen a rapid rise in the average uh, value of a ransom that's paid. Uh, the average payment is now $233,000. Uh, kind of lines up with a, a large, um, I don't know, how should I say it, a vacation properties company that was uh, that suffered from ransomware, and their initial demands were $3 million. And I know the person who negotiated them down to about $200,000, at which point the company said, you know, just pay it. 
you know, we've already got our cyber uh, insurance company involved. Um, they're going to, you know, pay us for the damages done, and uh, we've already, you know, told all of our customers that uh, this happened. So, 233 seems to be a, a good average right now. It's a lot of money. Um, one variant that we've started to see is data leak extortion. So it's almost like the attackers are double dipping. On the one hand, they want you to pay to decrypt your uh, data. Um, unfortunately, you know, trusting a, a thief is difficult. You pay them all this money, and then they don't actually send you the decryption keys. That could be a big issue. Um, so if you've lost trust in them and are, are deciding not to pay them because of that, um, they come back and they say, well, you know what, we also stole your data before we encrypted it. So they've got clean copies of all of your unencry unencrypted data, basically, and they're going to start leaking it. Um, so some sites are tracking those leaks, uh, which are some often they'll uh, leak, you know, uh, the details on 50 customers or something uh, as a demonstration that they actually have your data, and they hold that for ransom. And you're supposed to pay them the uh, really large payments in order to prevent that from happening. And unfortunately, that leaves you in the position of trusting them to do what they say and delete the data afterwards. Um, but that we're seeing uh, time frames uh, accelerate, so uh, cyber criminals are getting uh, better at orchestrating this, right? If, if, if you were to decide to become a ransomware attacker tomorrow, you'd have to set up some infrastructure so that you could securely uh, leak data without it being able to be traced back to you. Um, so the typical is uh, six months between uh, first uh, uh, ransom demand and the data being leaking, but it's getting very, very uh, fast now, up to three weeks. So things could kick in quickly if somebody is trying to extort uh, from you in this way. The you know cyber insurance, uh, and I've been involved in buying cyber insurance at the last company I worked at. Um, it seems like it's expensive, but it covers you for everything that you haven't invested in in doing. Um, so it's kind of a safety net, right? You should definitely do all the things I always tell people to do, the patching and deploying security tools and threat hunting and all the rest of that stuff, um, but you still have a risk, and you can counter that risk by getting cyber insurance. Trouble is, is the cyber insurance policy writers don't want to create giant exposure for themselves uh, to the tune of you know hundreds of millions of dollars, like in the case of uh, Maersk. Um, so you know they write clauses in there, uh, one of them being if it, if the attack is uh, deemed an act of war, then you're not covered at all. And so if your government claims that it was an act of war, as Ukraine could against uh, Russia uh, for the NatPetya case, then you might have trouble collecting uh, your cyber insurance. So. One other thing that um, I've heard from the experts in the cyber insurance field is that uh, quite a bit like uh, ransom insurance against uh, key employees, um, which many organizations have if they're uh, kind of publicly, if they're, you know, CEOs, a public figure, um, they'll insure against the, either the CEO or the CEO's family being kidnapped and held for ransom. One of the the uh, small fine print in their contracts is you're not allowed to tell the kidnappers that you have insurance against that. And the same thing's happening in, in ransomware. You're not allowed to expose to the ransomware kidnappers that you have cyber insurance because then it feels like a victimless crime. The only people who lose are the cyber insurance company. And if you ever publicize, um, which could be a complication because you know, but public companies probably should be informing uh, their investors that they have such things. But if you ever publicize that you have ransomware insurance, uh, that could nullify your ransomware coverage. So issues with that, and probably a last resort. 
Recently, the U.S. Treasury Department kind of took a, a high road in a stance that uh, basically uh, told companies um, that they, there would be sanctions for paying ransomware. Um, this is kind of a, uh, on the geopolitical scene, this is what you do when a uh, particular country is, is kidnapping your tourists and demanding ransoms. You don't pay the ransom. You know, we do not negotiate with terrorists. Uh, kind of statements, uh, but I think it's not uh, very well advised, uh, and yet that's where we're at today. Um, so if you do pay a ransom, uh, you are in danger of being sanctioned in some way by the U.S. Department of Treasury. So let's talk about defenses. First of all, the defense against the data leakage um, is, of course, encryption. Um, if somebody wants to steal all your data, the, the way to just stop that cold has always been encrypt your data at rest. Um, they, this is, you know, this predates the Internet, um, and it's at least a 20-year-old uh, field, and the technology is easily available to do the encryption of data at rest. The hard part, of course, is when you're using the data, because it's really hard to uh, tra do transactions on encrypted data, but certainly on your backups um, that the ransomware attackers are targeting anyways. Um, they should be, if, if you have backup, you should encrypt your backup so that you know that you've got that peace of mind. Now, I know it's simple for somebody to say encrypt everything, um, and technically it is. It's just math, and it's not very expensive anymore. The hard part is protecting your keys. You, and I, I spent a lot of time uh, working with organizations on just how to do that, how to use hardware security modules, you know, separate standalone appliances that uh, generate and store the keys. Uh, you need physical access to the device in order to get keys on or off of it. Um, you can rekey from them. So it gets extremely complicated very, very quickly to do a good job of key management even though the encryption part of it is relatively simple. Now, of course, to prevent the actual ransomware from working, if you had up-to-date backups of all your systems, then you also wouldn't have to worry about the ransomware side of things. You would just uh, clean up the machines you know, to make sure that you didn't have the uh, remote access Trojans and the actual uh, you know, crypto locker versions on it. And then you would recover all your data to it. That is not easy, right? It takes hours to transfer terabytes and petabytes of data around. Um, but a lot easier than paying $34 million in ransomware to somebody that you don't know, that you can't trust. But just like encryption, um, the devil's in the details. And, having, and because the uh, ransomware teams and attackers know full well that they have to get to your backups. They're going to look for the network attached storage devices and get on the servers attached to them and encrypt the backups as well. And that would be a you know, well-executed uh, ransomware attack. And that's where the importance of protecting the backup servers uh, come into play. First of all, backups shouldn't be uh, read and write. They should be read only, so-called immutable uh, storage, right? So it's uh, a little bit like cutting your data to a DVD. Uh, that's that's not uh, uh, you know it'll be read only after you've written once. Write once, read only. Uh, and putting in the uh, protections in the server so that that is truly enforced. And luckily, I've got Sanjay with me who can uh, delve deeper into that. But I'm really saying for that, you know, for complete uh, protection against ransomware, in addition to all the defenses that you need to prevent these targeted attacks from happening, um, you need to encrypt your data at rest. You need to protect, the, protect those encryption keys. Um, you have to harden uh, and micro-segment your network-attached storage so it's not shared to everybody. It's, just, it's got uh, very particular uh, know, paths to get to it. Uh, the backups have to be immutable. 
and privilege access management for the backup systems should be in place. In other words, uh, you don't have you know a universal password that everybody knows and sits in memory for the attackers to find uh, before they get there. Um, should be using strong authentication to get access to those and only certain privileged users. So I think I can let you uh, delve into the details, Sanjay, because we're lucky to have an expert on backup systems with us today. Gentlemen. Yep. Thanks, Richard. And I think what you just captured um, was really, really um, enlightening, right? And I just want to go um, and talk about uh, some of the things that you just said, right? You know, it is most very, very important that first thing first, like, you know, you protect the data, right? You know, data is the lifeline for many of the businesses right now. And there is a reason why why these ransomware attacks are going after this data because, you know, data has uh, value and most of these companies, um, our businesses depend on that, right? And I think that the most important piece is you know, the impact that this has on your business, whether it's because you're now talking about uh, your business operations, Richard, as you mentioned, right? There were times when the entire business was impacted, right? And this could result in significant loss of business, loss of credibility, loss of reputation, and the impact is far more greater than the solution and how you can overcome some of these pieces. Like, you know, you had a great checklist of things that needs to get done, right? You know, like, you know, you mentioned encrypt your data at rest, protect your encryption keys, right? You know, um, harden the segments, right? You know, these are all great stuff. And then there are some other very easy things. Don't click on those email links. <laughs> you know, that's where these uh, ransomware attackers get in, right? So having that education is very important. So let's talk about, like, you know, when it comes to protecting this data, what does it mean, right? You know, um, operationally, you want to make sure that, you know, you are not impacting the operation. So it's easy to just, uh, like, you know, have a backup copy and, and have that backup copy prote be protected, right? You know, ransomware is all about getting access to your data, encrypting it. So, you know, even if you have uh, encrypted your data, that's a great first line of defense, but that does not mean that it cannot be re-encrypted. So having it immutable is very important so that nobody can override that data. I don't know, that gives you the security. And then making sure that only the right people have access to that data is very critical. So at Cloudian, we are, we are so excited to talk about this is because we believe we have a great story and a great solution that a lot of our customers have used. And uh, that uh, is very easy because it fits into your existing data, back, uh, data backup and data protection workflows. Like we have it in this, this slide, right? You know, Cloudian, uh, just for people who don't know about Cloudian, we are an enterprise-grade uh, S3 object storage solution, S3 API-based object storage solution, which allows you to uh, store lots and lots of data, be able to scale this to hundreds of petabytes. It's cloud compatible, has, uh, has all the security features that are needed uh, and that can fit into your existing backup workflows, right? You know, the solution integrates seamlessly with uh, all major backup uh, application providers like Veeam, Rubrik, Veritas, Commvault, or you name it, right? You know, IBM, Spectrum, Protect, and so on and so forth. And, and what that means is now you have a, a storage target that not only is um, uh, less um, uh, expensive, like, you know, it's 70% uh, cost less than any other proprietary backup appliances, is faster than tape, and has all these security features that allow you to protect that data. We're talking about encryption, we're talking about uh, immutability, we're talking about access control, and, uh, and preventing uh, that uh, attack is, is something that you can do in your enterprises today. So. Um, that's basically Cloudian data protection story. When we talk about uh, immutability, one thing to understand, right, you know, immutability is, is done through um, uh, settings that allow you to configure how that data that you have written needs to be managed and accessed, right? You know, in the S3 land, 
uh, Amazon AWS S3 APIs have support for something called S3 object lock. What that is 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 an API that allows you to now configure at a granular level on how you want your data to be immutable. You can get, set up uh, buckets and make them immutable by enabling uh, certain configuration. And when we say immutable means that you can write to this bucket uh, once and they are only read only, right? You know, you can control the settings at the bucket level. Also through the backup applications who, who understand how to use this, applic uh, this API so that they can set it up in their workflow saying that, you know, if I'm backing up, let's say through Veeam, I can set up and say that, you know, I want this backup to be protected for X number of days um, and, and it should be applied to all my daily backups, weekly backups, monthly backups, and so on and so forth, right? And you can maintain those retention controls um, and, and all of those things are done through APIs, right? You know, you can, and Cloudian allows you to do this kind of settings at the granular level, at the bucket level. So it is very, very important that uh, your storage target or your backup target have the ability to offer immutable storage, worm storage, so that you can protect against this attacks. Uh, and when we talk about immutability, right, you know, it's also very important to understand what kind of immutability is it uh, offering, right? You know, uh, the API specs, uh, basically tell you that there are two ways to uh, to make your storage and your data immutable. One is something called governance mode. And this means that, you know, you now have the ability to make your storage and your data immutable. It is great for your data protection um, and you protects against all uh, some of these uh, rogue actions that we talked about where people are trying to get access to data and overwriting it. So it does definitely make it immutable. However, it allows also uh, from an enterprise IT perspective uh, ability to say, you know what, if I want to overwrite some of these settings that I have done in terms of my policies, in terms of retention timelines and all those things, you still have a privileged access or, or someone who is authenticated and has uh, gone through the verification for accessing and changing those settings so that you can like, you know, still be compliant but align with what your enterprise requirements are and, and be able to change things as and when you need to be, right? The other one, which is a much more stringent one, which is absolutely something that a lot of ours recommend is the compliance mode where it, it makes it uh, uh, truly in, uh, uh, immutable and also uh, makes it tamper-proof, right? And what I mean by that is, you know, uh, you can't even delete the data uh, even if you have a root access to your system, right? And a lot of times all these ransomware uh, actors, what they do is they find those back doors, right? You know, so in a software-defined storage world, right, you know, a lot of times if you look at these systems, they, they have uh, certain functions that require root privileges and then be able to uh, go and change your NTP settings so that you can change the timelines and then override some of these uh, immutability settings or, or change um, and go and delete data if you have root access to it. What this compliance mode does, it, 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 it blocks even those kind of uh, changes that can be made. So once you set it up, you can be assured that you know your data is going to be protected no matter what against outsiders and insider threats. And that's the flexibility that we give to our customers in how they can protect against ransomware. You know, Cloudian uh, has, uh, has invested a lot. And uh, the workflows, like I said, right, are very seamless. Today, they fit into your uh, existing backup workflow. So you're not required to reinvent and modify some of your uh, existing workflows that you are uh, put in, your enterprise IT has put in, in place, right? You know, what you want is a target that can be fit into your existing workflows and give you uh, the benefits of ransomware protection while also giving you the benefits of lower cost TCO and scale. 
you know, the, the workflow would be very simple, right? You know, you have your backup application that will now back up your data and will uh, set up configuration so that you want that data to be uh, protected by a worm bucket, an immutable bucket, right? So when you do that, uh, from the backup, any backup jobs that are written to that bucket now are read-only. And that means that uh, any malicious third-party ransomware or malware cannot change it. You know, it's, like I said, you know, you can also do encryption and other things, but the biggest thing you want is to avoid people from overwriting that data with an encryption key so that, you know, uh, that data becomes unreadable to you, right? So when you protect your data with encryption, it's great. But uh, you also want to protect from anybody else writing to it, and that's where immutability comes in. So in case uh, if you ever want to recover from it, all you have to do is um, recover and restore from your latest backup, and you now have a clean copy, right? What Cloudian also does is once you have that bucket that is immutable, you can also, with uh, internal Cloudian uh, storage policies, have that bucket be automatically be replicated to an offsite DR or to a public cloud so that you now have another copy of data. So always, whenever you're talking about security and data protection, it's all about how are you mitigating the risk? How are you making sure that you have a backup plan, right, so that you can recover from it? And this is where Cloudian Solution signs because you now have uh, the flexibility of taking advantage of a scale-out distributed object storage solution that offers security, immutability, worm storage. And, and we have been doing this for quite some time. We've been deployed in, in some of the most stringent um, uh, uh, environments where security is of topmost concern. And our Cloudian solutions have gone through rigorous certification, right? You know, you have uh, um, not only just uh, the ability to support worm, because, you know, you know, everybody can claim that, oh, I can offer worm solution. That's fine. But if your solutions have back doors, right, you know, in terms of, uh, like, you know, having root access or or doesn't have the compliance mode and governance mode, it, it does not really truly protect you against some of these threats, right? You know, if you look at what uh, we have done um, in this slide, what I've shown you out here is this solution has been certified, the immutability solution, the worm solution has been certified by third-party agencies, right? So we have certifications for... Uh, from the SEC 17A guys, FINRA 4571, some of the stringent uh, certifications from uh, the government agencies like, you know, FIPS, Common Criteria. We have some uh, uh, European certifications. So when you look at all these certifications and agencies that have certified Cloudian Solution, you can be rest assured that uh, you have uh, the, the best of the solution not only just for providing immutability. At Cloudian, we also have the ability to prevent uh, against tamper. And what I mean by that is, like I was telling you, right, you know, getting immutability and worm storage is great, but if you cannot prevent the back doors, then that is the weakest link in your solution. So at Cloudian, we have done is we have hardened our storage solutions, right? You know, we have the ability to lock out root access so you can't get root access, uh, and you cannot execute all the other commands that the root uh, users can do. So you can now minimize, uh, like you know, any impact that this malicious actors can do or rogue actors can do, whether it's insiders or or outside threats that will go and change some of the settings that would allow or make your data compromise. Right? You know, we have strict uh, RBAC rules. We have integration with IAM policies that allow you to segregate roles and responsibilities of users who are using this. And, and this is what I meant by having a complete solution that protects against some of this threat. So if you look at what Richard just said, you know, and this is very, very important. Right? You know, education about uh, people and security policies is very, very important. But from a protection of data, Encrypt your data, make it immutable, 
right? You know, make sure the solution. And my uh, my point to you guys is to make sure that the solution that you are selecting is able to not only do those things, but also offer hardened security and is easy to integrate into your existing workflows. You know, you don't want to make wholesome changes that would increase the complexity of your solution and disrupt your operational workflows. Something that fits in nicely, something that scales, something that brings in TCO is a win-win situation while also getting all the security certification, right? And this is why Cloudian, right? You know, Cloudian is, like I said, an enterprise-grade solution. We have over 500-plus enterprise customers. It is uh, highest rated in terms of Gartner. If you look at the latest Gartner critical capabilities from a magic quadrant for object storage, uh, Cloudian is rated number one solution. It has all the security certifications and the features and functionality that are required for a secure solution. I don't know whether it's uh, federal certification, states uh, or certain uh, industry specific certifications. We have all those pieces. You know, we offer native implementation of S3 APIs. And why is that important? Because like I said, you want the solution to fit into your workflows and, and make sure that all your applications and your usage is, is, com is, not, is not impacted, right? Having S3 native gives you that compatibility, which a lot of other object storage may not have, uh, so that you can support the entire workflows. The solution also is VMware certified and is offered on VMware solution, whether it's VMware cloud providers or whether VMware enterprise customers through vSphere. And like I said, right, you know, it's ranked number one by Gartner in terms of its critical capabilities across different use cases, whether it's data protection, analytics, life sciences, um, and, and, and so on and so forth, like cloud native applications. And that's what uh, like Cloudian brings to the table, right? You know, what we want you to do is, you know, like uh, Laura mentioned, right, you know, we have several assets that are attached uh, go find out about our ransomware buyer's guide um, get a we have a free trial on cloudian uh, get in touch with any of our cloudian folks so that we can educate you and tell you exactly how we have helped many of our customers put in a solution that help them protect against ransomware and i think this is one of the most important piece that you can do to protect not only your company but your company's business and and keep those malicious actors outside, right? You know, ransomware, like Richard said, is the number one threat to the businesses today. And, uh, and we need to take this very, very seriously. And uh, this is exactly what uh, we've been trying to do with a lot of our customers and are super excited about uh, the, the way we can help them out in, in making sure that, you know, uh, their data is protected. Richard, um, anything that you would want to add to what we just said in the closing thoughts? Yeah, Sanjay, as you're, as you're talking, I was thinking again of the NotPetya attack on Mirsk. And one of the side stories from that was that their Active Directory domain controllers were also uh, encrypted by the rants, by the NotPetya. And all of them were, were configured to mirror each other, so they thought they had disaster recovery taken care of, because what are the odds of all of them going down at once? But they're all on the same network, so they all uh, did get destroyed at once. But they got very lucky. There was one system that was offline in uh, Somalia, I believe it was, and when they figured that out, that they still had a clean copy of uh, their configurations for their domain controller, they sent somebody down to Somalia, picked up the hard drive from the system, and you know, flew it back uh, with themselves to London, where they could then replicate it and redeploy. Um, you know, tremendous. You know, three or four days in order to do that process. Not like if you had. Uh, an immutable backup of your domain controllers, which is you know a whole other uh, issue because we think about desktops and data stores, but critical systems like domain controllers also have to be backed up. Yep, 
and security is a holistic approach, right? You know, you can't just think about it and, oh, I'm doing work, right? You know, you have to pick the right solution um, and be able to make sure that that solution has all the other capabilities that you really need to fit into your overall plans for security. And I think that's, and that's what we have learned, right? You know, that's why we have invested so much in making sure that the Cloudian solution offers complete end-to-end -end security, including the certifications, which will be really needed if you're looking at cyber insurance, right? You know, we, um, a cyber insurance company is not going to give you uh, insurance if you have a solution that is not certified, right? So all those components need to be looked into. And... Uh, and the worst thing that you can do for the enterprise IT is put something in that requires wholesome changes to your workflows. So that's where uh, having something like an enterprise uh, solution that offers all these features, has the ISV ecosystems, all these solutions fits into and certified with all these backup applications is huge. And, uh, and you can get two things at one, right? Be secure and lower your TCO. Um, it's a win-win situation. I love it, and I think I think that's what uh, that's what we have for today, right? You know, with that, I think uh, we would uh, like to um, like you know open it up for any questions or of any comments, and uh, and take it from there, Laura. Yes, great. Thank you so much, Richard and Sanjay. This is really, really great uh, information, and um, we do have a few questions. Just a reminder to anyone out there, um, if you want to go ahead and ask some questions, if you haven't already, uh, use the ask, ask a question tab at the uh, bottom of your screen. Um, so uh, there's one here for you, Richard. It, it says, what is your view for the future? Do you expect ransomware attacks and ransom amounts to continue to increase? Yeah, I'm afraid I do, and it's based on that uh, dwell time calculation from the early uh, phishing attacks that we saw in March. Um, so because, you know, I'd like to say that all the low-hanging fruit, those that don't have good security practices, don't have recoverable backup systems, have already been attacked, and, and anybody who is attacked reacts by getting more secure. For some reason, budgets are always loosened up after a successful attack. Um, and I'd like to think that we've been through all of those low-hanging fruit for attackers, but obviously that's not the case. It's the uh, tip of the iceberg in people that are vulnerable and people are deploying new systems all the time without taking into account all of the threats against those systems. So, yeah, ransomware is with us for a long, long time, longer than COVID, I would suspect. Uh, and that's a long time, too, I'm thinking now. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> taking, um, <laughs> taking steps to, uh, to ensure that you've, you know, you've covered every layer of defense you can, right? Because you're, you're also going to be targeted for people who just want to steal your data for espionage, industrial, or geopolitical purposes. Um, and you've got to protect against that anyways. So that's going to stop a lot of ransomware attacks. Um, and, and the backup and recovery capability is, going to give you that final um, uh, safety blanket uh, and sense of relief so you can go to sleep at night. Okay, great. Thanks, Richard. Um, so next question, are there any impacts to dedupe with the right lock? Sanjay, I believe that's for you. Yeah, and I think uh, the answer is um, no and yes and no. So if your backup application is doing the dedupe before the data is written into the worm or immutable storage, then there is no impact. However, once your data is written down and you try to uh, dedupe it after that, then you cannot edit or change it and you're, and that's where it gets impacted. But from our experience, right, you know, like, you know, I think our backup applications like Commvault, Veeam and all those things, they they dedupe the data before they even write it to the storage. So in that case, there is no impact. Okay, great. And, and you kind of started to address this. When used with Commvault, does the worm lock impact dedupe? No, exactly what I just said, right? You know, if yeah. the backup applications are going to dedupe this data before they get written to us, um, then there is no impact. Great. 
Um, and then another question is, how does Cladium protect against other threats that bypass immutability? So, you know, one of the things like I was highlighting, right, you know, immutability is a setting on the storage side. And uh, there are a lot of rogue actors uh, that have figured out a way. I think one of the most common thing is to get into the system, the physical system, uh, underlying operator uh, operating system, and then change the NTP settings so that you can bypass the clock that is uh, what protects the data. And uh, and uh, and then be able to or have uh, privilege access and then delete the data. So one of the things that Cloudian, a few things that Cloudian does is it, it locks down that privilege access, and uh, and that means that you cannot change uh, certain system configurations or cannot delete data. Uh, and that's something that is very very critical. A lot of the software defined solutions that offer immutability and worm storage don't don't account for this thing. So you may feel that your data is protected, but this uh, this rogue actors are very sophisticated. They know how to work around that, right? And that's where you need an end-to-end -end solution, and that's what uh, Cloudian offers. Okay, great. Um, another question is, does Cloudian have a way to detect threats and notify us? Oh, absolutely, and I think this is another area, right? You know, I think, Richard, you mentioned this, right? Most of the times, it takes about 200-plus days for for the detection of ransomware to happen, right? And uh, and that's a lot of time for these rogue actors to either delete data, copy data, or steal it, right? And, um, and the best way to protect against this is to have uh, real-time monitoring, right? You know, Cloudian has... Uh, real-time observability and monitoring solutions that basically can allow you to configure custom alerts. So for example, let's say I have set up a worm bucket, right? And uh, I see someone uh, trying to delete data. It should be an immediate red flag and should be immediately uh, alert needs to be associated and sent to, to the right authorities. Or if you see unusual activities where, like, you know, when you're encrypting, that means there is a lot of writes happening. You can immediately flag those things, right? Um, audit logging. So all of those pieces are part of our enterprise storage. That's why I kept saying we are an enterprise storage which has the ability to do all of those pieces. And this is exactly why um, why you should be looking at Cloudian. And, uh, and the solution is very simple. Like, you know, it's a cloud-like storage solution that fits into your existing workflows, right? You know, you don't need uh, uh, many FTEs to set up, configure, and manage, right? You know, we have people who have a single, uh, once you set it up, it's non-disruptive to scale, maintain, upgrade, uh, can be managed by a single F FTE to manage uh, tens and hundreds of petabytes. Well, um, that's, that's awesome. We had a few other questions, but um, I know that we are out of time. Uh, so I wanted to thank you again, Richard and Sanjay, for uh, for the presentation today, the time today, the really great information, and, and also to our audience out there, thank you for joining us.